Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Um, we'll give it a few seconds to let everybody join. Um, please let us know in the chat where you're joining from. That'll be really nice to see. Um, and we'll get going in just a few more seconds. Lots of people piling in from all over the world. Mexico, Georgia, Latvia, Egypt, Poland, Iran, Saudi Arabia, amazing. Um, okay, so let's begin, I think that's enough time. Um, right, so hello and welcome to today's assessment summer camp session. Um, today's session is called English Success for Young Learners, How to Build a Solid Framework Focused on Learners' Progress. And today we'll be hearing from Eleonora Pessina and Joanna Wiles. Um, Ellie is a product manager at Pearson English Assessment. She has over 15 years of experience in the language education sector. Um, she's currently leading Pearson's portfolio of proficiency assessments for young learners and adults. Um, jo is also a global product manager with Pearson. She's working on K-12 English language learning products and solutions with a particular focus on pre-primary and primary. Um, Jo's worked in educational publishing for nearly 20 years across all age groups. Um, both our speakers have great experience and passion for what they do, so this is sure to be a wonderful session. Um, just a few notes before we get going. We'll have a short Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. So please feel free to submit any questions that you have along the way in the questions box at any time during the talk. And we will ask um, Ellie and Joe to answer as many as we can, um, or as many as they can at the end. Um, certificates will be sent out um, in the days following this session. And the session will also be recorded um, and available to you too, in case you would like to share it um, with any of your colleagues. And now I'm very happy to pass over to Ellie and Joe. Thank you, Sophia, and uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. It's uh, great to see so many of you. Wow, I see more than 200 people at what is uh, a prime time of holidays in many parts of the world. So thank you for taking the time to join this today's session. And um, as Sophia was mentioning, uh, the focus of today's session is on English success for young learners and uh, how uh, we can help you really deliver uh, a successful teaching programs that covers all the journey from uh, assessment to teaching to achieving results, achieving measurable results. Um, just a bit more detail about what we are going to do in today's session. As you know, the title is about English success, and I do want to start with that. I want to I want to hear from you. What is your definition of success in an English language program for young learners? Then I want to go in into a bit more detail about how we define success and in particular how we define language progress at Pearson. And I want to talk about some general tools that can help you identify and measure progress. And then um, the reason why you've got uh, a speaker like myself on the assessment side and my colleague on, uh, on the courseware side, we are going to take a look at a couple of examples of tools that help you build that um, that successful teaching program. So I'm gonna talk about two assessment products. Uh, one is English Benchmark Young Learners, and then uh, another uh, test that is designed to certify a level of achievement. And then Joe is gonna take you through some examples of how you can use uh, Pearson English courseware to uh, really uh, monitor the progress throughout that your students are making. But let me, let me really kick off with uh, an icebreaker question. I want to hear it from you. I want to I wanna hear what success looks like to you when we're talking about young learners and when we're talking about an English language program. So feel free to type in a chat a few words about what is success for you. <clears throat> and yes. We've got being able to communicate with others with ease, uh, regardless of the mistakes and errors. Um, they enjoy English learning, mm -hmm. able to communicate 
um, success to feel confident with. Um, success is when the learning objectives are achieved. Hard work, confidence. Confidence is coming up quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, can use in English to communicate. So communicate and confidence, I think, are your key words there, Ellie. Yeah. Um, and motivation. Keep motivating and have fun. So, yeah, love coming in now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. When I ask this question to an adult audience, it's always about getting a certificate. So uh, I, I, I totally relate to all you're saying with uh, young learners. It's really about, you know, building that confidence, that engagement and along the way, ensuring that kids are progressing because ultimately that's what, uh, um, what our job uh, I used to be a teacher myself as teacher is uh, for um, the kids. I do have another question that is more related on the progress. And um, I'm curious to understand now how you are, what you're using at the moment to ensure that your learners are progressing with English language learning. And uh, in this case, I think I can uh, launch a poll. Just give me a second. Um, and I'm gonna put it on screen. Oops. Yes, that's worked, Ellie. Oh, okay, has it? So I'll give it a couple of minutes to see some answers coming in. You can see the answers, can't you, Ellie? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. I taught myself something new today. <laughs> I didn't know how to launch a poll. Uh, so observation come in top one, top followed very closely by assessment, which, um, you know, it's going to definitely be a topic for today's discussion. Uh, checking homework and classwork. Yeah, they, they are really in order, <laughs> which wasn't deliberate, but uh, they are. <clears throat> I'm curious, the, the, the people that answer other, what other ideas do they have? If you can use the chat. But yeah, essentially it is all these things that you are mentioning for sure. Uh, it's a mix of uh, informal ob observation. I hear that a lot. Sometimes it's a time to give them a test, a formal test, but uh, definitely this is, um, this is the uh, kind of thing that we'd expect. And um, <clears throat> now let me close the poll. And then this takes me uh, really to the next, to, oops, yes, the definition of, uh, uh, I wanted to give you my, or our, our Pearson definition of success, how we think about success when, we're the, uh, when we are developing resources. And it's all those things that you've been feeding back. It's a mix of the more tangible and the less tangible um, aspects of learners, uh, uh, progress with English language learning. Confidence is speaking is prime. We're teaching a language, so communication has to be key. Uh, it's uh, a certificate, passing a test, a score of some kind sometimes does come up as well. Um, one aspect that we also, um, you know, challenge ourselves a lot, especially in, uh, in the context of young learners, is how beyond English language, how do we develop uh, future life skills? How do we develop things like critical thinking, the ability to collaborate with others, uh, the ability to develop independent study skills? So uh, we're not looking at English language learning in isolation of uh, um, life uh, skills as well, especially in the development of uh, very young kids. And of course, the progress is a key thing, uh, ensuring that kids are actually making progress, they feel motivated, and they want to keep going with English language learning is key. And, um, and this is what, I, what our session is going to focus on today, progress. And, um, and really, I want to talk about some tools we developed at Pearson to um, 
to really give ourselves a definition of progress, but to also help you measure that progress and make it very visible to the learner and even to the parent in the context of young learners. So, um, but before that, I really like to contextualize the idea of progress in the context of what I, of what I call the teaching and learning cycle. In other words, all the things that uh, teachers have to do as they are delivering a program. So this is my representation of, uh, it's the one job of teaching that I say that is made up of multiple parts all the time. It's quite complex. And, um, and one thing that I am sure nobody disagrees with is that the, the job of teaching goes, uh, it, hands in hands is really intrinsically connected with the job of monitoring learners' progress. And to me, there are critical moments in which this progress uh, has to come very visible and uh, is important that teachers uh, get information from their kids in order to uh, take actions. So one critical moment is really at the start of a learning cycle when uh, you may be working with a new cohort with students or maybe it's a, it's a class from the previous year and you need to understand uh, where your students are at. So at this point, it may not be progress as yet, but the uh, the idea of diagnosing students' needs is, is what helps you set a baseline and helps you uh, identify what kind of variance there is later on in the learning cycle. And the, the diagnosing part of, uh, of this teaching and learning cycle is what helps you then plan your teaching around your students' needs and, uh, and then teach your program to your students. Other critical moments in, uh, in which progress uh, can become more visible is whenever you are um, giving any opportunity of practicing to your students because uh, that goes in ha hands in hands with activities that you do to check whether your students are with you or they are following you in the learner journey and if they're not then again uh, think about ideas of how you can uh, remediate, repair the gaps in your learners. And this is really, to me, this is an ongoing loop that happens all over again. Um, happens many, many times during the duration of the course. And this is what is uh, really the, the secret source of the job of teaching. Then, uh, um, the, another critical moment is whenever we have a formal assessment moment, it could be at the end of the, of the term, it could be at the end of the academic year, where, uh, um, uh, you know, typically we hear it a lot, teachers uh, uh, take uh, uh, a bit longer tests, maybe they can be even, um, you know, international tests or a test that are required by your state. And that is uh, the moment where you are assessing progress over a period of time and you can look back at how much uh, progress has, has been made by your students. And the last really critical moment, uh, which is uh, something that we hear is common in some schools, not so common in others, is whether uh, the school decides to enroll their students in an international certificate. So we, with this really, my, my key argument was to show you how progress is really um, is really crucial to the teaching and learning cycle and how there are many critical moments in which you're able to uh, visualize that progress. Um, talking about Pearson tools uh, to, uh, that assist this design, the way we think about progress, uh, I wanna spend a couple of words on uh, the global scale of English. And I'm just curious from the audience, how many of you have heard, are familiar about the global scale of English? Okay, I actually taught myself to read polls as well, <laughs> to read the chat. Uh, ah, I hear well, there's a few people not familiar, some that are. So let me tell you just briefly about it is, and apologies to those of you that are, uh, have heard about this, but the global scale of English is really a framework that we developed at Pearson to 
uh, be able to describe learners' ability. It is uh, a scale, a framework that is uh, building on the, G, uh, on the CEFR, the Common European Framework, so the framework of levels that goes from below A1 to C2. And um, it is really uh, the DNA of uh, what underpins the development of all our courses and all our assessment. Um, on to the next slide. Um, what, I, what underpins the GSE? Let me see why I'm not progressing. Yes, what underpins the GSE like the CFR is a set of learning objectives. And by that, I mean a set of can-do statement divided by skill that describe learners' ability in quite a fair amount of detail. So uh, interesting for the purpose of today's uh, conversation, we have different sets of learning objectives for different types of learners. And, uh, and uh, what's interesting for today is that we do have a set of learning objectives specifically designed for young learners that takes into account the cognitive development of the younger learners. Um, and, um, and the GSE, like I was saying, is really uh, at the core of what all we do at Pearson. And it's really been designed to give you that granular insights into learners' ability. And let me, let me tell you a bit about that. So um, as I said, the GSE is, um, is, uh, it was that tool that we designed to make progress very visible. And uh, why we thought of that? We, we, ours was the reflection on what uh, the CEFR uh, is able and not able to do. So on, um, on one hand, uh, on this slide, you can see how many hours it takes to, uh, for learners to progress within a CEFR band. And you see it's lower hours for A1, more hours for B1. Uh, and I've got two sets of values, two sets of numbers on screen. I've got uh, the speedy snail, like I, uh, I like to call it, and the slow snail. And this is representing how many hours would a child need in order to progress of the one band, one band on the CEFR. Um, the reason why I've got two values is that uh, we know that learners learn at different pace and uh, you know, what you see in on the speed in the snail is the um, minimum number of hours that learners would take to progress a level on the CFR. And on the other hand, you see the number of hours that they would require if they were in, a, in what we tend to call a low and slow class. So basically, my, my argument here is uh, you still see uh, that learners need many hours to see that jump, that uh, step up in their progress journey. So, and what I want to show you now is really in, uh, I want to compare it with how, how much time it would take to learners to progress by three point on the GSE scale. Why three point? Because that is, uh, uh, that we believe is the smallest measurable progress that you can measure on the GSE. Uh, that is definitely not uh, falling into the standard margin of error. So basically that tells you that actually some development has been made. And uh, just by comparison, you see that the amount of hours uh, is a lot lower. And, uh, and why this is helpful? This, is, this goes back to our original design that we wanted to develop a scale that would help you measure progress even within a level and, uh, and really motivate the learners and make it very visible to the learners. And at the same time, that would give you the data that you need to be able to uh, take the learners to the next step. So that's a little bit of uh, background to the design and why we have the GSE. As I was saying, the GSE is really the DNA that underpins all our uh, courseware and all our assessment products. And I wanna take another look at the, uh, the teaching and learning cycle here and show you how we have products that really cater for every stage of the learning cycle. So um, we've got English benchmark to diagnose learners' needs, 
uh, at the start of the course, and I'm going to talk about this product in more detail. Then uh, we've got the, uh, an enormous amount of courseware uh, that uh, is what you need for uh, all the stages that I was telling you about planning, engaging, teaching, checking and repairing. And while this is just one block in this, uh, in this diagram, I do want to emphasize that this is uh, uh, the, the core of uh, of, um, of the solution that uh, makes um, makes this, uh, I would say, this is a key element of uh, what makes the Pearson integrated offer. And then uh, um, the last point, then I wanna, um, for assess, uh, we do have uh, English benchmark young learners again, because that is uh, a test that is designed to be a formative tool uh, to be used at different points of the learner journey. And just quickly, we do also have uh, a, a test that falls into the interna international certificate bucket, and that is the Pearson English International Certificate. So moving on, um, I do want, before I get into the details of, uh, of the assessment products and the courseware products, I do want to, um, I do want to make a distinction and I don't want, I want to make a clarification because in this session, you, you'll hear us talking about two different sets of tests, uh, what, I, what we'll be referring to as the in-course test, and what uh, I also will be referring to as the proficiency tests. Uh, so the in-course test is probably the, the resource you're mostly familiar with, and it's uh, all that suite of tests that come with the course, and that can include your unit test, your uh, checkpoint test, your progress tests. And then uh, proficiency tests are the like of English benchmark young learners that I'm going to um, present you uh, just in a little bit. And uh, what is the difference between the two? Um, I want to make this distinction because that puts it in context what's coming next. The distinction is, uh, is really, um, I like to look at it from three point of view. First, on the type of output. Proficiency tests are tests that are designed to give you uh, a, a score on a standard uh, scale, and in our case, is the GSE scale. And every scale, every score of the GSE is also aligned to the CEFR. And um, so, this is a key characteristic of proficiency test. And this is what in-course tests simply don't do. Um, then there is a difference in, uh, in the design of this test and in the scope of these tests. Proficiency tests, I like to call them um, a photograph or learner's ability, um, regardless of what has been taught to uh, the learner uh, or, or, what con or what course has been taught or what content has, has been taught to the learner. So basically proficiency tests are really designed to uh, get to the to get an understanding of students overall ability and even their ability to um, to apply the skills they learned even to new contexts. So whereas in-course assessment are, are, um, are tests that are designed to really test within the boundaries of the syllabus of your course. Um, and the last point that I, I wanna make is that proficiency tests, just for obvious reasons, for the design reasons that I was telling you, are, are generally longer and more comprehensive tests. Whereas uh, in-course tests, depending on the type of test you're looking at, are generally typically shorter and very uh, concentrated on the material that has been presented in the course. So I just wanted to put this context because that's a question we get asked a lot. But let me now get into the, um, the details of English benchmark young learners. And um, again, to place it in the context of a teaching and learning cycle, this is the tool that you could use at the start of the course to uh, diagnose the students' needs, to understand their strengths and weaknesses, particularly if you are working with a mixed cohort or a mixed level, uh, mixed ability, a group of students. 
And then it is the test where you could use once again to, after a period of, of time, to understand how much progress has been made to, and to understand again what strengths and weaknesses your students have. We typically uh, recommend the, to take English benchmark young learners at the start and at the end of the course. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of consideration that can, uh, can make, can vary that. Um, typically we want to allow enough time of learning in between the two um, testing sessions. So just more on what is English Benchmark Young Learners. Well, like the title suggests, it is a test for young learners and it is a test that has been designed with a formative goal to be able to understand really what students know and to be able to give you the data that can help you plan. Um, the um, when I say it's a test that is uh, really designed for young learners, I really want to emphasize it because it's not just something we say, it's something that uh, we has guided the design of the test throughout. So um, it is a test that we designed with gamification principles in mind. You can see a few images from the test where uh, you see engaging illustrations, uh, videos, and we really wanted to, to take the stress out of the testing experience. I think one of the best feedback that we get from uh, our customers is, uh, is our teachers that are telling us how kids uh, uh, really don't know that they're taking a test and they enjoy the experience of this and they feel like they're almost playing a game. <clears throat> And, uh, and again, uh, um, uh, another key point is that every single button, every single feature has really been designed with, uh, uh, with the needs of young learners in mind. So, so um, I wanted to emphasize that concept. In terms of what this test is, is a digital test uh, that we deliver both on tablet. It originated as a tablet app, but uh, now it's also available as an emulator by that I mean an application that mirrors the app experience onto a desktop. Um, and uh, it is a digital test that is testing across the four skills of so speaking, reading, listening, and writing. It's uh, for the age group of six to 14, and it's broken up into six levels so that you can really hone into the abilities of your students depending on what level are they're at. Um, as we said earlier, it's a formative test used as a diagnostic or a formative tool can be used throughout the academic cycle as a measure of progress and sometimes can even be used as an indicator for uh, high stakes exams. Um, I just wanna give you very quickly an overview of the type of activities that you get in uh, English Benchmark Young Learners. Uh, so you've got some listening and reading skills uh, activities here. A lot of these activities of the receptive skills have been really designed to uh, for the child to get an input and to act upon that input so that we are really, um, we are really targeting comprehension. For listening, for example, a, a key activity is uh, for the child to visualize an image and to identify the word by here. So there is this, uh, uh, it's a highly interactive test for kids. And, um, and of course, all the activities are very much graded for from uh, word level to sentence level to text level. Um, on the other side, I've got some examples of writing skills. And again, here we've got a range of activities that go from um, from more closed activities to more open responses activities, depending on the ability of your students. And one clarification I wanna make is that writing is not a skill we test at level one when, uh, when we're testing at the lower end of the scale, taking into account that these are young learners. Um, speaking, um, I wanna spend a couple of words on speaking because this is, uh, uh, a need we often hear from teachers that they're unsure, they don't know how to assess speaking, uh, 
uh, in a consistent way. Um, the, the, the unique aspect of EBYL is that speaking uh, is, uh, uh, relied, uh, is relying on artificial intelligence and is automatically scored so that you can get a, a very uh, accurate, but at the same time, a consistent measure of the speaking abilities. And again, the same principle of having to interact, having to hear something and then take action, communicate back, applies to the type of activities that uh, we have in English Benchmark Young Learners. Um, so after these excursus a little bit on, uh, on the test, I really want to come back to the, um, to the reason why we're discussing EBYL, which is uh, how EBYL is really helping you monitor the progress that the students are making. And to me, the answer really lies in the reporting capability and the very powerful reporting capabilities of this test. Um, at a high level, I'll, I'll show you some examples, but <laughs> Um, there are uh, um, there are multiple ways of uh, uh, of drawing reports from this tool that look at overall class abilities on one hand, but also at individual students abilities so that you can move between levels and you can see how the class is progressing and how specific students are also progressing. And then on top of that, we also have uh, uh, certificates and parents' reports. Parents are a, are a key stakeholder in uh, the young learners' uh, um, education uh, reality, and uh, we are generating reports in local languages for parents. But let me give you uh, a bit more insight into what what is the data that you get back from this test. Here I've got an example of the class report. The same report exists for individual students that at a glance gives you an overview of the student of the class proficiency broken up by scale. And for each skill you get a value, a score on the GSE and you get how that score relates to the CFR. And in the bottom section, of course, you get a breakdown of the students in your class. Um, where the richness of the data really lies is on the second page of the score report. And I've got an example here on screen because for every skill, you get a detailed description of what the child is able to do and it's expressed in a simple can-do statement. Um, but not only this, the uh, the real uh, secret, if you want, the secret source of the, of the reporting functionality is uh, on the recommendation that the test gives you. It doesn't only um, describe the student's ability, but it also gives you actionable next steps, uh, which, appear, which uh, appear in the form of GSE learning objectives that you can use uh, to uh, take the students to the next level, to stretch your students and to ensure that they are progressing but also on a recommendation of activities that you can do with your students. And there are two sets of recommendation. What I'm presenting here in, uh, in the red box are general activities that you can take with your students. And, uh, on, um, and uh, what I've just highlighted, uh, if you happen to use Pearson courseware, we map these activities and we map these learning objectives to the course that you're using. So immediately the recommendation not only tell you what the child should be doing next, but they tell you also what activities you can find in your courseware that you can use with your students. So that to me is really the power of this tool in order to measure the progress that there are, the students are making, but in order also to give you the data that you need to plan the instruction. And uh, really, this brings me almost to the end of my session. Last piece I want to show you is, um, is an example of uh, a progress report of this time. As I was explaining, Benchmark Young Learners is a test that is designed to be taken at regular intervals. Uh, and uh, what it can also generate are reports that look at trends and, and compare different test results. So here we're looking at, um, we are comparing a test session in September, another one in January and the last one in June. And you, you can really get, you can really keep a close eye on that 
uh, progress monitoring of your class. So this brings me to the end of my session and I'm gonna hand it over now to Joe to talk about uh, the, all the brilliant things that we have on the courseware side. Thank you, Ellie. And so I'm gonna have to ask you to be the moving on the slide person. Um, so we are now moving into the plan stage. So we can move on to Ellie. So as you probably all are aware, planning is at the heart of all effective teaching practice. And it's a key aspect of ensuring your learners make progress. Teaching and learning plans tend to be broken into three different ones. So we talk about the long-term ones and that's where you would be adding in your yearly student goals or outcomes. There's high level topics. And then medium term, which is usually done on a half semester basis, where you plan in what you're going to cover week by week. And then short term, which are more like group lesson plans or lesson plans with those lesson objectives and details of the activities and resources. And why do we think planning is important? Well, actually, planning is the key to progress, in fact. It is the moment in time when you will be establishing the goals or those learning outcomes for the students. And by learning outcomes, oh, you've clicked Ellie. <laughs> um, and by outcomes, what we tend to, we're talking about global end of course outcomes. So can they, your, what you may have identified was, uh, I want my students to speak with confidence. I want them to be able to pass an external international certification. I want them to make progress on the GSC and you may be more specific about that or it could be beyond language learning and going into those future skills. So working collaboratively, or the, you may want your students to work on critical thinking. So those are your big learning outcomes. And then the next part of your planning is about how you're gonna achieve those outcomes. So what tools are you gonna to use to identify class areas of strengths and weaknesses? And Ellie has just taken you through EUIBL, which is a great tool in order to do that. You, know, you may have other tools such as prior teaching reports. Um, you're gonna be identifying ways to measure that progress and also deciding which methods of assessment throughout the course you're gonna use and all those different types of assessment that I will go into. So how can we help you with that planning? Well, as Ellie talked about just now, we believe that the GSE is a great way to support you with planning and especially planning for progress. So we have the GSE Teacher Toolkit and if any of you have been to Mike Mayer's session, he goes into this in quite a bit of detail. This is a resource for you as teachers to use and it helps you identify those key GSE LOs that will support your bigger learning goals. It also enables you to search for the most appropriate, level appropriate content to support your lessons. And then as Ellie just mentioned, each of our courses has these mapping booklets and they list the key GSELOs per course on a unit and skill basis. So you can use both of these tools at the beginning when you're planning your curriculum and thinking about which areas you want to focus on. Going into a little bit more depth about what we offer within the courseware, well, all our Young Learners programmes have teachers' books, teachers' editions, and at the start of every unit, we also have the curricular objectives, and these are directly related to the GSC LOs. So again, everything is tying together to the GSC progress. Um, so you can see here, we have it on the listening, the, the ICANN statements. And then moving on to your short term planning, we have a lot of support with that short term lesson planning. Um, in this tool with Big English, there are digital lesson plans, which you know, and you can preview the activities and move them around. They give you the time that we would recommend. And they have the specific elements of what you will be doing throughout the lesson. So these lesson flows, so with your warm up, your lesson objective again. And these lesson flows embed assessment for learning methodology, which is what I'm gonna go into in the next slide. We also provide assessment and um, homework tools. So for that more data crunching, and so you can have some qualitative results on progress. 
So moving into the teaching and learning cycle, and I'm even part of the cycle, I'm even going to embed practice check and repair in this. Thank you, Ellie. Sorry, I keep making you move everywhere. Um, I want to spend some time on assessment for learning methodology. We believe this is one of the best tools to, um, to help you measure progress, but also to support assessment and to support progress of all your learners. So what is assessment for learning? Well, it enables your students to take an active role in their own learning and seek out help when they need it so that they're responsible for their progress and able to meet their goals. So we're putting the learner in the center of their learning. It's not about the teacher saying, I want you to get there. That they're obviously be a core component of the teaching and learning, but it's definitely about including the learner. So the three key principles that underlie assessment for learning are students participating in setting these learning objectives, performing ongoing assessment, and helping students learn how to set their own goals and self-assess. And these are all actual skills that you all, we all use throughout our careers as well. So they're really great principles to embed in at that very young learner age. Assessment for learning, it covers a, a whole plethora of formative assessment, um, but lots of activities that you would see through the courseware. Um, opportunities for classroom discussions, peer or group work, homework, traditional quizzes, and tests. And this ongoing assessment, it informs the teaching of the next lesson or the module. So it can ensure all the students, whatever their starting point makes clear progress. So that whole planning is about a living document. So you're coming back to it and assessment for learning supports you through that whole journey. Thank you, Ellie. Now to look a bit in detail about how our courseware embeds this assessment for learning methodology. I'm gonna use Big English, but the, most of our primary courses do embed assessment for learning. Um, the methodology is embedded throughout the course. So you can see here, this is just an example from one of our teacher's books. Um, it's the same on the digital. There are lesson objectives, and these are clearly presented at the start and at the end of the lesson flow. These help students to focus at the very beginning of the lesson but then reviewing them at the end really helps students to start developing their own self-awareness of progress that they are making, and also what they may need to do with your support in order to improve. Looking more detail in the teacher tools of assessment for learning, we have this really, really lovely feature. And I think this is one of the key features that teachers, or I know you speak English, really like, and it's this, um, um, process and it's got monitor, so it's a bit blurred. Um, involve, monitor, assist, and challenge. So every activity is, is assigned to one of these processes and it aims to help teachers see which students need more of a challenge, which ones need remediation, in order to keep everybody progressing. So it's a really great guide for teachers to support all learners in your lessons. And then if we're moving on to the sort of the practice element and the checking and repair that Ellie mentioned, well, there are opportunities throughout the, the lessons for students to practice individually in pairs or groups. And those key moments for teachers to observe, which I think you all put in the poll is one of the main ways that you measure progress and monitor progress is through observation. So we have lots of little pair activities. And then we also have at the end of the unit, these beautiful little review pages, and they help you monitor the progress across the four skills. And then, depending on the outcomes or the results of what the learners have done, we also provide remediation and stretch activities to really hone in on those individual learning needs. Thank you, Ali. Another part of assessment for learning and a really core element is self-assessment. So the learners measuring their own progress. Um, and it's really important to get them engaged with measuring progress and understanding their progress. Um, and in Big English, we have this really child-friendly way of doing it. So it's the feature that's built in into the review lessons and it's at the end of each unit. So you can see the I can statements again, and they have these stars. And again, in the workbook, these stars that they color in. And it really requires students to think about the key learning objectives of the unit 
and to what extent they may have met them. Um, it helps them raise awareness of their progress. And it's a great tool for teachers to gauge who has learning gaps that need to be filled. And we, I'd be really interested if you keep on putting in the chat, or if you could add into the chat about who uses self-assessment and how they do self-assessment. Because I think this is something that we ask quite a lot in our, in our role. Do you do stars? Um, do you do happy and sad faces? If you have any ideas of what you, or what you currently do in your teaching, please do add them to the chat. Ellie, could you move on, please? And then, so you've got your, we've talked about the observation tools and the self-assessment tools that we offer. And then we have something a little bit more formal, which is those in-course assessment packs. And uh, you may remember what Ellie was talking about, the difference between the proficiency and the in-course assessment. So the tests are based on the content particular to that course. So it's what's taught within the unit. And there's a wide range of formats, um, of controlled practice, and then also freer practice for speaking and writing. And this again, helps teachers and learners to identify any gaps in the learning. So you can see here this lovely student self-tracking progression chart, and they can, can circle the smiley or un smiley face, and the teacher then can go in and repair and see what needs to be done next. Thanks, Heidi. Um, also, in our some of our really recent courses, we are really looking at ways that we're measuring progress in and how you assess skills progress. So beyond content, um, the, the progress within writing functionalities or reading functionalities. So you, we have here some checklists and criteria based marking to support you to help mark writing or mark speaking and then the skills development chart, where you can look at the I can statements and go and tick through the tests, can they do them? So again, quite an informal way, but really helps you monitor how they're progressing within the skills themselves beyond content. And then I've mentioned future skills a few times. This is really a key um, element and passion, I think, of everyone who works in PS and Young Learners is about really developing skills for the future. And in this course, which is English Code, we are looking at ways of measuring progress in future skills. So this is a really lovely activity where they, in the workbook where they can add stickers against creativity, collaboration, critical thinking and communication. And it just helps them recognize when they're doing an activity that goes beyond language and teaches them additional skills and maybe helps the teachers identify where areas where they may need to support more or provide more activities to do that. Um, and then just lastly, so sort of bringing everything to a close, we are now within our courseware really supporting teachers in identifying those opportune moments to use English benchmark young learners. So you can see that we in this course, at this particular moment, we're recommending would be a great time to use EBYL. So it's a bit of a, a whirlwind tour around our courseware, but I hope you can see that we have loads of tools right from that very beginning of the circle and round and round and round to really help you measure that progress, which is so key to learners because it goes beyond just tests with that observation that really getting them the passion for learning English. We want to provide you with the tools to do that. So I hope you found that useful. And I think we're handing over to Sophia for questions if there are any yes thank you very much for that really interesting really nice to see how um you know the same kind of principles stretch across our assessment and courseware and how everything's kind of bound together by the gse and and how that can then flow up to adult learning as well really really interesting session um and yeah we've got a few a few questions in um on um English benchmark young learners can is it possible to use English benchmark young learners without Pearson courseware someone's asked okay yes um it's a typical question and thanks for that question uh, because um 
sen är det att vi klarifiera. It, it definitely, my answer is absolutely you can. And the reason why we designed this test uh, is a test that can work uh, with any course you're using. It could be Pearson, could be your a competitor, or could be even be your own content. The overall design of this test is to take a picture of what students have been able to internalize and make their own and uh, and that is the difference between proficiency and in-course assessment that I was uh, referring to so absolutely it's uh, it's that independent measure of students overall ability um, of course if you do happen to have a Pearson course where you have the added feature that the recommendation are mapped to the course you're using but it's not mandatory at all it's optional so thanks. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, and this is a question for both of you. Um, our audience would like to know how they can access these products and if it's possible to get any sort of samples or demos so they can try them. Yeah, I can go with the assessment bit and I'll pass it over to Joe. Um, what we recommend uh, you do is you contact your local uh, representative. Uh, certainly, you can take a demo of the English Benchmark Young Learners, but what we recommend is that you set up a, 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 short, a small pilot. It could be with your uh, um, teachers' colleagues, or it could be even with a small uh, group of students, so that you can really see the power of this tool and the power of the data it generates. So that's on uh, assessment. Sorry, just muting myself. Um, so if you go on to uh, the Pearson website and we can put that in the chat, um, you can direct yourself uh, to the primary if you're interested in young learners, but it's the same for secondary or adult. And um, there is a, usually a page for every course and we do show some samples, but then you normally sign it, create an account in order to get more samples so you can really get in touch with what each course offers. And then, as Ellie said, there's always a local Pearson um, representatives that you can talk to, too. But yes, yeah, so we have quite a bit on um, YouTube, but also on the Pearson website. So I will add that into the chat, too. And I realise, Ellie, I'm so sorry that I just jumped and missed the end slide on certification. So I don't know if you want to just show that one because you, you did spend time creating that slide. <laughs> Uh, well, if you if you want, I can do quickly. Um, I wanted to, you know, conclude this journey on progress uh, uh, by really. Now I need to reshare my screen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making it more challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so I really want to make a very very brief uh, mention. Let's see. Yeah, you can see. Oh, I need to go. Okay. Yeah. I really wanted to make brief mention of that certificate stage that some of you may do, some may not, but are thinking of doing it, which is, uh, you know, uh, that stage where you take an international certificate to uh, demonstrate the level that the students are at is really the overall purpose is to have that uh, demonstration of achievement of a certain level and we do have also a, a solution for this uh, which is called it used to be called the Pearson test of English uh, for young learners and has been recently rebranded to Pearson English International Certificate for Young Learner. But that, you know, what I'm, where I'm going with that. And it is a test, a certificated test of, uh, powered by Pearson at Excel. Uh, it comes in four levels, testing across the range of pre-A1 to uh, A2 plus. And uh, it is the kind of test that uh, you uh, take in test centers. It's paper-based differently from EBYL. And it's a test that, as I said, is really designed to give you that level uh, of achievement. And, uh, and going back to the uh, the reason why we're talking about progress is to really motivate the students to really see how much they are gaining from English and uh, and giving them a certificate of uh, and um, and for this we have a certificate of achievement uh, in this test. So I did want just to make a brief mention, but thank you, Joe. We can uh, go back to uh, questions as well. 
So I think that leads us on to another question quite nicely, which is the um, the difference between benchmark and someone's asked the difference between benchmark and our level test. Um, what is the difference between those two tests? Yes. Um, I'm still sharing my screen. Can I just? Yeah, OK, let me. <laughs> it was confusing me to see many things. Uh, so what is the difference between a level test and a benchmark test? Great question. Um, so a level test, uh, like it says on the tin, is a test that is designed to identify your level across the scale. So uh, generally speaking, I mean, we do have a level test at Pearson. It's not for young learners, but it is a test that uh, um, uh, gives you an indication of the student's ability across the uh, scale. And it's uh, just one single test. It's an adaptive test because it needs to gauge the student's ability depending on what they're feeding back to uh, in terms of answers. Because it's, it's um, also the other thing that I wanna say, a level test tends to be a, generally a shorter test. It is a short test for us. It's uh, uh, around 20 to 30 minutes. And the idea is really to give you an indication of the level, nothing more. Uh, when, uh, when it comes to a benchmark test instead, the job of a benchmark test is really to get you the details of what a learner can and can't do. And so one key difference is that a benchmark test, a benchmark, uh, both the adult benchmark and the young learner's benchmark are graded in multiple levels. It's not one level for everyone. You will have to have some sort of an idea of whether a learner is uh, an A level or a B level or, or a C level. Um, so, and, uh, and really the, the core difference lies on uh, the power, the diagnostic nature and the power of the data it can pull out. Uh, so that's in a nutshell. And uh, um, we do have a level test for uh, uh, learners aged 14 and plus, uh, and we can, uh, I can share the link in a moment in chat if you need more information. That's great, thank you. Um, this is one probably more for Jo, um, about homework. How much homework is suitable? What's gonna give the optimal results? And how does homework differ from, you know, um, in, from the, the work that you assign in class? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't think there's one answer to this because depending on where you sit in terms of your teaching philosophies, you could be a teacher who doesn't want, who doesn't give any homework at all, or you could be in a school that really prefers to give quite a bit of homework. And also it depends on the learners. So I think what we found in our research is that at the younger end of primary, we tend to look at a couple of times a week, two or three times a week, depending on the school. But it really depends, I say, as I say, on the philosophy of the school and what you as a teacher believe you've got through in class. For me personally, homework shouldn't just be set because you need to do homework. Things to do at home is about that reinforcement. So there may be things that actually only a group of students need to do, but then you can't just single out that group. Um, so I think it's about really using homework as a tool to support the progress and giving them things that um, they can easily do at home and actually don't need their parents support to do because I find with my children with some homework actually it becomes my homework because I have to sit down with them for 40 minutes and sometimes I don't even understand it so I think that is a challenge and I think you need to think about that when you're giving homework and we do do the homework assignment in um on through Pearson so it does help a little bit but I just wanted to plug a particular passion which is reading so for me if it was just reading they had to do every night I think that's what they should be doing because reading gives them access to vocabulary, to critical thinking, to a global worldwide view and for different and to look at social emotional learning. So reading in the home language and reading in English is just so, so important. And it's the difference between um, earnings when you're an adult for those who've been reading as a child and been read to. So my plea to you all is encourage reading regard it instead of homework. <laughs> Wonderful. A good message to end on. 
Um, and yeah, I think that's that's really all we've got time for. I'm afraid there was a couple of questions we didn't get around to, um, but I hope you found the session really useful. Um, please check out the other sessions. There's still lots to go in our summer camp series. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to both of our wonderful speakers today and to everybody for coming and hope to see you here soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.